I know we are being suppressed, but it doesn't really affect me. Sometimes I feel bad for people, but there is nothing I can do to change things. These are the words of one so indoctrinated that they can't be bothered about it anymore. As Chinese censorship keeps taking more of a root in society, completely blinding many, it seems that free-thinking opinions are a thing of the past. This is not by accident, however. This is through the meticulous planning and structure that the Chinese Communist Party has implemented over decades. To put it quite blatantly, China controls its citizens and wields a strong iron fist to keep them in line. In this modern age, this comes through a strict policing of the internet that leaves no room for external influence. China controls the internet, and by doing so, controls its citizens' way of thinking. As the West argues that this is a violation of citizens' rights, China argues that this is still a democracy, just a different type than what the West is used to. So the government actually requires Chinese internet companies to employ armies of human censors to police user-generated content on their platforms. To understand how China controls the internet, one must understand Chinese censorship. And that's where we shall begin today. As the world's most populous country, one of the things that Chinese governments over many different eras have always feared was a population with various opinions and voices. With well over 1.4 billion people, you can imagine the political upheaval that several divided voices would cause. This is why, under Mao Zedong, China saw the height of censorship. Radio, television, newspapers, you name it. All of it was almost exclusively controlled by the government. This continued for years, but this kind of suppression soon began to have its toll. Whenever people feel suppressed or unheard, the kettle boils over. The Tiananmen Square protests, which were student-led demonstrations calling for democracy, free speech, and a free press in China, the noise of gunfire rose from all over the center of Peking, are evidence of that. This called for a new brand of censorship that could hold the lines of democracy and censorship together. At the same time that China battled with this, the internet saw its age dawn on the nation. A tool that could instantly connect the masses at the click of a button could now either be dangerous or helpful to the government. It was a crucial point for the nation, one that came with a great dilemma. The internet came to China in 1994, under the presidency of Jiang Zemin. His decision to develop the internet in China was heavily influenced by Alvin Toffler's third wave theory, which claims that the world is moving away from the industrial age to the information age. For China to compete with other countries on the global stage, the internet needed to be accessible in the country. This way of thinking followed the guidelines that had been set by Deng Xiaoping, the former leader. Dong had tried to walk the line between Mao's extremism and the West's liberalism. The reforms carried out by Dong and his allies gradually led China away from a planned economy and Maoist ideologies, opened it up to foreign investment and technology, and introduced its vast labor force to the global market, thus turning China into one of the world's fastest growing economies. To put it quite simply, Deng Xiaoping carried the torch for the open-door policy that China pursued, even after his presidency. As the open-door policy was implemented, China struggled to strike a balance between opening up to the Western world and keeping its people away from Western ideology. Deng Xiaoping said that if you open the window for fresh air, you have to expect some flies to blow in. To keep these flies away, the Ministry of Public Security thus initiated the Golden Shield Project in 2000. This particular project poses one of the most ironic dilemmas in modern history. On one hand, the Chinese government desires to use the information technology that comes with the internet to drive its booming economy. On the other hand, the internet inherently encourages diversity of ideas and is a tool for democratizing society. In other words, while the internet is important to China's economy, 
Its very existence also undermines the country's political stability. China is constantly seeking to strike a balance between these two ends. This is where its need to manipulate the progress vehicle that is the internet comes in. This is where we get introduced to China's attempt to do this. There is a lot of debate in the West about the free flow of information on the internet. But in China, there is no debate, making the World Wide Web not so wide. Once the internet was launched in China, the masses ate it up like cheesecake on a teenager's birthday. Wow, what a strange comparison. Within 15 years of its arrival, almost 30% of the Chinese population were plugged in and loving it. In a bid to keep its citizens from being exposed to what was described as harmful Western ideologies, the Chinese government immediately took action by launching the Golden Shield Project. Developed by the Ministry of Public Security, the Golden Shield Project, now known as the Great Firewall of China, is the Chinese government's internet censorship and surveillance project. Do you remember those flies that Dong said come in with the fresh air? Those are what the Great Firewall of China seeks to keep out. However, as you will soon find out, it does more than just that. You want to visit Facebook? Blocked. Google? Blocked. Twitter? Blocked. Well, how about YouTube? Blocked again! China has essentially, through its Great Firewall, limited its citizens' access to outside information. By offering alternatives within the nation, like Baidu, that the Chinese Communist Party can police, the government limits what its citizens can view. What China is doing through its firewall is not banning the internet altogether, no, it gives the illusion of free will. How it does this is by restricting the sites and platforms it cannot control, but giving alternatives that it can. In so doing, the average citizen can use the local apps and have their needs met, all the while being none the wiser. When you search for things that include a particular keyword or trigger words like a massacre or Chinese oppression or the like, the search results that you would get on Baidu differ from those you would get on, I don't know, say like Google. This is because China limits the exposure that its citizens have to anything that the CCP views as damaging to the CCP. But then again, after learning from previous incidents, for example, the previous revolts, Chinese censorship takes on a fresh form, as you will soon see. China does not outright ban everything that they do not agree with. No, no, no. China practices what I'd like to call selective banning. People are free to complain online about any number of issues, as long as those are issues where solutions can come from and be implemented by the Chinese Communist Party. If something is contrary to the CCP's actions, that is when it gets banned. People can complain about a certain lack of service, but when people start arranging to meet up and congregate, the powers that be shut it all down. Basically, China gives just enough leeway for the illusion of freedom online without actually giving room for the manifestation of opposition to rise. Pretty sneaky, right? At this point, you're probably wondering how China could control such a vast web and put on restrictions like that. Well, it does this in three main ways. Let's take a look at them. The first method that the Chinese Communist Party implements is called IP blocking. IP blocking is a method used by internet providers and businesses to restrict access to a website or application based on IP addresses. It's a way websites might use to block internet users' access based on predetermined criteria, like geolocation and IP reputation. This is how the government restricts access to foreign sites that they do not have control over. By restricting internet users' access to specific content and web services, the government insulates itself from the majority of the masses knowing, let's call it unfavorable information about them. Without boring you, let me simply explain how this works. IP blocking works by targeting specific IP addresses or ranges that the government wants to block. This is what the Great Firewall of China does. Once connected devices try to communicate with a web server, a website like uh, Facebook, for example, their IP addresses are checked against the block list. If an IP number matches one of the banned addresses, the firewall denies access to that specific device. This is what the government has been doing so far. However, it is still fairly easy to get around this. Just like the several ads you see talking about VPNs, 
one can make use of a virtual private network to circumvent this firewall. Yeah, that's right. Those are for more than just watching Canadian Netflix. Bet you didn't know that, did you? All it would take is a few dollars a month and one can bypass the firewall. Well, does the Chinese government not know about this? Of course they do. And very few individuals do make use of these tools. However, the vast majority of citizens don't. Whenever unnecessary steps are mixed into a process to make it harder for people to do something, in this case, search the web, the usual reaction is that people just won't do it. And in this way, the majority of the masses are denied access to foreign sites, but are given many domestic options to the point that eh, they don't worry themselves with VPNs and all the other ways to bypass the firewall. DNS poisoning, or domain name server poisoning, is one of the primary methods used by the Chinese government to limit users' access to information. This might be hard to understand, so let me give you an analogy to help you wash that down. Imagine that, as a senior year prank, high school seniors change out all of the room numbers on their high school campus, so that the new students who don't know the campus layout yet will spend the next day getting lost and showing up in the wrong classrooms. Now imagine that the mismatched room numbers get recorded in a campus directory, and students keep heading to the wrong rooms until someone finally notices and corrects the directory. DNS poisoning is the act of entering false information into a DNS cache so that DNS queries return an incorrect response, and users are directed to the wrong websites. By exploiting the DNS server vulnerabilities, the Great Chinese Firewall can divert traffic away from legitimate servers towards fake ones, all to serve their agenda. Again, much like the previous method, for the general populace, no one will be any the wiser or care enough about the solution. You do remember what the girl from the beginning of the video said, right? This leads us to our last primary method that China uses to stop its citizens from getting what is deemed as information that should not be accessed. One can solidly argue that this might be the most effective tool that China implements. Well, what is it, you ask? It's culture. A culture of self-censorship. You see, what makes the Great Firewall of China so effective, and also controversial, is not only its complex technology, but also the culture that the system facilitates. A culture of self-censorship. The Chinese government mandates that companies be responsible for their public content. In other words, it's the job of these companies to make sure that their online portals do not contain any prohibited topics or obscenities. Leading online news media in China, such as Xinhuanet.com, ChinaDaily.com.cn, ChinaNews, and Baidu.com, obediently follow the government's decree, pledging that they will make the internet a vital publisher of scientific theories, maintain social stability, and promote the building of a socialist, harmonious society. Even transnational internet corporations such as Google, Yahoo, and Microsoft are also subjected to self-censorship regulations, because it's either they follow the rules or they get axed. And although censorship is very much against Western ideology, the size of China's market is too profitable for the companies to bypass these opportunities, thanks capitalism. However, self-censorship does attract criticism in the Western Hemisphere. For example, Google's decision to censor some of its content to please the Chinese government is currently one of the most discussed topics in the Western media. Within China itself, the big companies that provide alternatives to foreign apps now know how to fully comply with the regulations to not upset the big golden brother in the sky. There are also many other small tricks that the Chinese government, or, well, rather the CCP, implement in keeping their grip on the nation. For example, they deliberately lag apps or communication sites in areas that are susceptible to revolts and riots. By keeping a strong internet presence, China keeps preserving its political interests that come through the suppression of expressive voices. Take note that I said expressive voices. You can talk and complain just so long as you don't offend the Chinese Communist Party. More often than not, as giants like Jack Ma found out, it may be hard to blur the lines between what you think is possible and what is actually allowed. The wild thing is that more and more governments globally are starting to take after China, 
and adopts such censorship measures. This might just be the beginning, but it signals a lot of bad things to come. As for our core subject, I'll leave you to decide whether this is truly a violation of rights, or as China tries to argue, a different kind of democracy.